<laughs> Good evening. Um, welcome to Matinee for you, Today we have a very important topic. <clears throat> anger prevention as well as anger management. And we hope anger prevention should be done most, mostly the first time because management is a little difficult. Mm -hmm. So today uh, I'm inviting Mr. Matt and Mr. Ray to both discussing about anger management and prevention. On behalf of all of you, I'm inviting both Matt and Ray. So today's, today is the 15th session uh, in matinee free webinar. So both Matt and Ray, you are welcome. Okay. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, appreciate you being here. Um, anger is a very important subject, so we're going to dig into it today. Um, there's different parts of anger. There's uh, when what we're talking about today, and we're a little bit having an argument here, which is kind of fun, is that we are trying to prevent Just anger. We angry, are man. trying to prevent anger. That's the key to this whole thing is to prevent it. And there sometimes we're there already and sometimes we got to deal with it because we are we are angry so once we get angry what do we do with it and that's management so i'm going to talk a little bit about management and then i'm going to turn it over to ray and he's going to teach us how to not be angry period or if we are get get unangry quickly which is management so anyway so let me share my screen real quick and off we go so um whoop. All right, hang on. Okay, so again, we're talking about anger management, anger prevention. Um, um, so I'm saying anger is the most misunderstood feeling of all. We've got tons of feelings. This is the, it's got a bad rap. People don't understand it. They don't like it. They don't know about it. They don't talk about it. It just, well, actually more in the United States now, people feel very righteous and angry and they're okay with being angry in a in a haughty kind of way. Um, but real anger is tough to deal with and people don't know how to deal with it. And a lot of pe people are very, very angry and they don't know what to do with it. It's destroyed more relationships than any other feeling, most likely. We can't prove that, of course, but it's probably so. Um, but it's, I think that it's all, also been positive for the world. Uh, Ray, anger can be a wonderful tool um, if it's, uh, that was given to us if we use it wisely. If we don't know and appreciate and learn to even like sometimes to like our anger, we're denying a big part of ourselves. When we work on uh, in positive mental health, we're working on some of the positive aspects of anger as well as the negatives. We're trying not to judge our feelings too much and, and go, these are okay and these are not okay. The feelings themselves are okay. What you do with it is a whole other story. What you do with your anger, that's where you get in trouble. People don't get in trouble for being angry, for feeling angry. They get in trouble what they do with their anger and what they say and what what happens next, right? So that's a, that's really, really important part of this whole thing. Um, anger can have as a feeling, just as a feeling, strictly not not judging it and not uh, talking about what some of the yucky stuff that we do with it. But the the anger itself can be very motivational. It can keep us warm. It can keep us awake. That's one of my things. I've always tried to stay awake, and so it's it, it's actually pretty effective. <laughs> um, it can help do it. Help us do things we don't want to do. Like oh, all right, and I'm I'm gonna get myself to do that. I do that sometimes too. I can make. I'm angry about having to do it doesn't matter the feeling gets me up and going and so um so i can get myself to do stuff i don't want to do by using my anger um it can definitely help protect us right in a lots of ways it can help direct us by saying hey i'm upset about this i don't like it i'm going to do something about it for example our our whole nonprofit is based on i don't like the education that i got i don't think it was right I don't think our education system is worth the darn is in the emotional training area yet. Yet it's moving in that direction. I'm happy to say, but I'm pretty, I've been angry for a long time about how, um, how we don't learn, teach kids how to deal with their own selves and without their, with their inner world. I'm getting teary here thinking about it. It's just, 
it's just wrong, wrong, wrong. And I'm angry about that, 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 um, that we don't teach kids about their emotions, about EQ, exactly what we're doing right now. Um, that's not cool. It's been horrible for me and it's been horrible for a lot of people and it's getting worse in the United States. You guys know about the school shootings. It was a six-year-old, you hear this? A six-year-old shot their teacher, came in and shot his teacher and thought it was kind of, that's kind of what you do. I didn't like her. That's why he shot her. I didn't like her. What the? The heck is that how you deal with your anger it, clearly we need some uh ability to manage our anger kids think with video games with the role models that we have now with the movies if you're angry at somebody shoot them run them over what that the number one video game is called grand theft auto right what do you do you run people over and then you get points for it right that's what you do when you're when you judge somebody or you're angry at them i don't think so so we got to teach people about their anger. In my opinion, it's one. It's the most misunderstood emotion, as I as I said. And it tells us what matters to us. It tells us what matters to us. If we listen to it, we can find out who we are, who we're not, who what we care about, what we don't care about, who we care about. Some of that stuff is all inside of our anger. It's pretty wild. Um, here's an interesting one. All anger is manufactured, right? We are not born with it. So that means we create it. We, we learned it. We made it. We created it with our thoughts, right? Which is what Ray's going to talk about. And we're our thoughts can make us really angry or they can change our anger into to get rid of it. They can stop it really quickly. But it, it's the thoughts that did it. There are thoughts and therefore anger is manufactured we made it up we made the thought we make the anger every time they didn't make us angry people don't make us angry ever right right <laughs> they don't ever anger is based on our thoughts there's no natural anger it's optional 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 this is pretty cool aristotle said being angry is easy managing your anger not so easy which is true anyone can be angry that's easy but to be angry with the right person in the right degree at the right time for the right purpose in the right way not so easy not so easy and that's true um here is one of my favorite books i just got it about i don't know a couple months ago from gandhi from gandhi think about gandhi talking about anger as a gift <laughs> hello right that is kind of talk about counterintuitive i mean his whole point was peace right we don't do anger because we we we're going for peace right no <laughs> no that's not what he said he said <laughs> we take our anger and we use it we use it this this uh, book is actually written by his grandson Aaron Gandhi and about his grandpa he went and lived with his grandpa for a while and he said anger was was his main motivator his main motivator of all the peace that he went for was because he was angry about how it was how they were treated how specifically how the British people treated the Indian people he was pissed about that and he told him and he but he used it he used it and he said no we're gonna be peaceful we're gonna you do it differently pretty cool and notice that you are you are in charge of your own anger any person capable of angering you becomes your master right they're in charge not you if they made you angry they're in charge not you anger um when you permit yourself to be disturbed by them pretty cool i think uh, no one makes you angry. You make yourself angry. More specifically, your angry thoughts make you feel angry. And that's what Ray's going to talk about here in just a minute. Uh, much of our anger comes from expectations. People should do what I think they should do, not what they do. <laughs> right? They're not doing what I what I think they should do. That's not okay with me. Uh, here's quick three th quick things that we fight about a lot. Importance. We need to feel important. We need to feel connected and we want to be in control and things, those are things we get angry about and fight about. So, like I said, we don't get in trouble for being angry. We get in trouble for what we do with our anger. So, um, in, um, in, in, and I, Ray's going to talk about how did not get angry here. Um, but I'm, I, I say one more time that, 
Um, we don't, we actually already are anger. Mostly we already are angry. And so we do need to manage it. We do have stuff going on inside of us mm-hmm. in positive mental health. We do healing work and we do inner child stuff and we work on our emotions, our real emotions, the big ones that are inside of us. And everybody we found has some anger about something. If they don't, they're probably in denial about it there. If you look, you're like, Oh, wait a minute. I am angry about that. And it's stuff from a long time ago often. And it's, get stuck in your body and it needs to come out of there because we start believing things and we start making decisions based on our anger that we're not even aware of that we're and that means we're not even in control of ourselves that's not cool so if we try to say you are probably are angry and let's talk about it let's deal with it let's go and get in there and see what's going on and get some of that out of you but it's that is anger management to me so here comes anger prevention. I'm going to shut up now. And Ray's going to talk about how to not do any of this. <laughs> <Which is cool. laughs> well, I'll just share my screen, Matt. Okay. All right. Uh, while, while I'm thinking about it, Matt just reminded me of something I left out of the presentation. Uh, there's an old saying uh, that an overreaction is an age regression. And that makes a lot of sense. It's always made a lot of sense to me because that's what happens. Uh, Let me just get this going here. Uh, Basically, you're plugging into some old ruts, thoughts and feelings you've had many times in the past. And it's easy to go down that pathway. And it's because it's happened to you in the past. So when you overreact emotionally, you're basically regressing and it reminds you of something that happened to you in the past. And your brain's very good at picking up those similarities because that's its major primary function is to assess threats. So something that might have felt threatening in the past, your brain's going to be constantly looking for that. And it's very quick to pick that up. And you can end up in an old place real quick. Uh, I used to call it your old familiar feeling. You end up feeling the same way you have many, many times before. Okay, anyways, anger prevention. There's an old saying, ounce of prevention is always worth a pound of cure. And that's always been true and still is. Uh, when you prevent anger, you also prevent needless interpersonal and even on a, all the way up to international conflict. You prevent needless suffering, even death. And you foster interpersonal and inter, intrapersonal, interpersonal and international peace, which is the goal of Matt's nonprofit. Uh, We'll start with some of the basics. Emotion is energy to move, to help us deal with perceived threats. And the key word there is perceived and to help us get what we want and need. Uh, but anger is maximum energy to move. It's an emotional half of fight or flight. And the other half is anxiety or fear. Uh, it's intended to deal with threats to life and limb, okay? But most perceived threats people get angry about fall far, very far short of that, okay? Now, people can often start out with anxiety or fear, and it can morph quickly into anger and fight instead of flight, but they can go back the other way too, and sometimes do. Now, I like to call anger emotional nitroglycerin. You're really dealing with something that's just as hard to handle as the real nitroglycerin. It makes people highly reactive. They're likely to even overreact. And there's an old saying I've always I live by. One of my rules as a teacher or parent has always been, or a person, has always been there's two ways to make something you don't like worse, do nothing and overreact to it. Now, uh, so this is how I, I like to use what I call a think, feel, do thermostat. And this is, I'm getting some sun coming in the garage here. There you go. Uh, I like to, you know, create this thermostat. And this is how I set it up. And at the top of it is anger. And you can have a a small amount of anger, a large amount of anger, but it's a qualitatively qualitatively different emotion than frustration, irritation, and annoyance. And then it causes you to be more likely to react or overreact rather than respond in the best possible way because there's just so much energy to move. Now, frustration, irritation, and annoyance are also energy to move. It's enough to motivate you to respond in some way, but not so much you react or overreact. You're still free to respond in the best possible way. And they are qualitative, quantitatively and qualitatively different than anger. And the reason is because they have different cognitive origins. Now, frustration, irritation, and annoyance come from wanting, 
preferring or desiring something and not getting it or losing it or even simply imagining doing either. That's where anxiety comes from. And anger can too. If you think something, you're going to lose something or not get it, you can get angry ahead of time before it even happens. So this is how I would set it up in a think, feel, do thermostat. Okay, you set your thermostat at one, preference, desires, and if things don't work out the way you want, then you're going to get frustrated, irritated, annoyed. And how frustrated, irritated, annoyed will depend on how much you want it, prefer it, or desire it. But you're still relatively free to respond. Now, anger comes from thinking you need something. It's a necessity in your life and demanding it and then not getting it or losing it or imagine doing either. And this is what I, so you would move your thermostat up to the top level. Now, we always consider the frequency, intensity, and duration of emotion. Okay. Now, anger problem, somebody has an anger problem, it usually means they generate a much greater frequency, intensity, and duration of anger than is necessarily helpful. Now, one of my, my mentors was a guy named Terry London, who was like, kind of like the son to Albert Ellis that he never had. And people, you would always ask him in classes, aren't there times when it's good to get angry? And his answer was always the same. Anything you can do when you're angry, you can do better when you're not. And if you think about martial arts, they don't teach people to get angry and you know plug into anger. They teach people to stay centered and just take care of business. Now, uh, but the human history, the way I would answer that question, look at the human history of anger. Anger has probably saved many lives throughout human history. Okay, however, it's been a driving force behind much needless conflict at all levels, from interpersonal to international, and it's caused much needless suffering and even death. So it's kind of a, a double-edged sword. Okay, now people with anger problems or issues and who break laws because of their anger, are often asked by courts, for example, or required to take anger management classes. Now, the word management suggests doing something after you get angry, which is fine. You know, that's like, but to me, that's like closing the barn door after the horse is already out. Okay. Now, I looked up some uh, anger management on some sites online here just to see what other people think it means. This is from the Mayo Clinic which is a well-respected uh, medical clinic in the United States and maybe throughout the world. I'm not sure how big their reputation is, but these are some of the things they said, think before you speak, once calm, express your concerns, get exercise, take a time out, identify a possible solution. That's all this stuff on this list is good advice, okay? Now there was another online site and I, I lost the, the site, so I just put another online site identify triggers, consider whether anger is helpful or unhelpful, and so on. Okay, and there's a whole list of things. Focus on facts, get a quick workout. Uh, you know, these are all things that might have some impact. The problem is, I, I was taught this saying in one of my cl REBT classes, advice is stupid because fools won't use it and wise men already know it. So that's a problem with giving advice is that people have to be in the right mental and emotional place to access and act on that advice that they've been given. And people with anger problems usually aren't there. It's not possible for them to do that. So Dr. Ellis used to talk about the difference between getting better and temporarily feeling better. So getting better means permanently reducing the frequency, intensity, and duration of your anger. Doesn't mean you get rid of it because you can't. You're hardwired to become angry in situations. The key is when you perceive a threat that you elevate to the level of life and limb. Now, uh, why prevention? Why well, I think prevention is the best approach. When we practice thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, we create ruts in our brain. And I really love this concept of ruts because it's so simple for people to understand because just about anybody who's ever driven a car or rode a bicycle or even walk the trail knows what ruts are. And ruts make thoughts, feelings, and behaviors automatic. The thoughts that cause anger, the anger itself, and the behaviors that follow are usually deeply rutted in people's brains. They're things that they've practiced many, many times before. Therefore, they're all quite automatic. And once people create such ruts, they can never get rid of them. And they can easily plug into them at any time. And I, I'd still plug in. Sometimes I get mad in traffic 
and I'll start cussing somebody out. And then I have to remind myself, no, he doesn't upset you, you upset yourself. Okay, it's hard to get out of those once you slip into them. A lot of people struggle with that part. Once they get angry, it's like the Incredible Hulk. Okay, and the other problem with anger is once you get there, it gives you a false sense of power. And people like being angry, especially people who otherwise feel powerless. That's why it's a big emotion for a lot of troubled teenagers in schools. And that's why we get these shootings like Mac Miller. We have a lot of them in the United States. Uh, it gives you a false sense of righteousness. And my mentor used to always ask, you ever met an angry person who thought they were wrong? So trying to reason with somebody who's angry when they're angry is pretty much a waste of time. Uh, it gives them a false sense of permission. It's why people do so many unacceptable, illegal, immoral things that violate their own morals and values. Uh, they see no reason to stop while they're angry. And protection, it gives them a false sense of protection because as long as they stay angry, they don't have to feel other feelings they don't like feeling like anxiety, depression, or shame and guilt. Uh, somebody I met a long time ago once told me the other side of guilt is resentment. You know, if you go up to an alcoholic and accuse them of being an alcoholic, they're probably going to get mad at you because the way they protect themselves, it's kind of like what I call being a rattlesnake, where they coil, rattle, and then strike out with venom because it turns the anger helps them protect themselves from feeling the actual guilt that they feel. Now, I like the Incredible Hulk metaphor. Uh, normally, Dr. Bruce Banner is an otherwise calm, rational person. He's a scientist. However, once he gets angry and hulks out, all hell breaks loose. And he does a lot of needless destruction. It doesn't stop until he expends a lot of energy. And that can take some time and a lot of damage can be done. And that's what happens in interpersonal relationships or even in wars happening in Ukraine right now. Now, anger or hate is triggered by perceiving what someone else says or does as a threat. The problem is human beings too often imagine threats where they don't or need not exist, and then magnify ones that might out of proportion to reality. And human beings have been doing this throughout history. Right now, we have politicians in the United States encouraging people to do that, to see trans people or LGBTQ people as some threat to them, to see schools and teachers as some threat to them. They're banning books and doing all kinds of crazy things, just get really out of hand. All right, so here's the steps I would urge people to do. One is, first step is to choose to have unconditional self-acceptance. That's what Alice called it, USA. Now, you know, reason is to fix something, you have to be willing to face it and look at it. Now, Ellis used to say shame blocks change. Now, shame comes from believing you're not living up to expectations, either your own or others. And having an anger problem and knowing you have that could be a way of believing you don't live up to people's expectations. Uh, shame makes people want to keep what they think and feel or struggle with, like anger, a secret. And it makes people less likely to seek or accept help that might be available to them less likely to take the advice from the Mayo Clinic or anyone else. And it makes people more likely to be what I call a rattlesnake or a rattler. Uh, rattlesnakes become very defensive and they coil, rattle, and sometimes strike out with venom. Well, some people become like that because they have so much shame. And that's one of the ways they respond to the shame because it's a threat to their symbolic self. And I'll mention that in a few seconds here. So unconditional self-acceptance means simply choosing to see whatever you think and feel, for example, being angry and what you say and do because of it is part of being human and understandable given what your life experiences have been and what you have had to deal with at the moment. Some people have had a lot more to deal with than others. There's an old saying, it's easy to be an angel when no one ruffles your feathers. Well, some people have had their feathers ruffled quite a bit in their life and it's understandable that they might be quicker to be angry and get angry than someone else. Now, part of human simply means you certainly won't be the first human being in history to generate more anger than is necessary or helpful, a greater frequency, intensity, and duration. You certainly won't be the first human being in history to say or do things that make your life and sometimes the lives of others worse because of your anger. Okay, and you certainly won't be the last. So you're always going to have a lot of company there. Okay. Understandable means if you put other human beings through what you've been through in your life, they'd probably end up thinking, feeling, saying, and doing much the same. 
Some may have fared better, some may have fared worse, but most would probably think, feel, say, and do much the same. Probably be angry too, a lot. Now, if we have, the way I like to explain, if we, suppose we all came with movies of our lives and others had to watch yours when you met, when you first met somebody, they'd probably see the understandable reasons you get angry the way you do. Now, step two is to evaluate your own thoughts, feelings, and actions in a non-judgmental way. And there's some very simple questions. Ellis used to call these functional disputes. You're basically questioning just how you think and feel and what you say and do and how functional that is with regard to what you want. So the first question is always, what do you really want? How do you want to feel? What do you want your life to be like? And every question after that depends on how you answer this first question. And the second question is, how's it working for you? That's why it's a functional dispute for you to get so angry and, and say and do what you do when you're angry? Does it make it easier or harder to get what you really want and for your life to be the way you want it to be? And the last question is, if you keep getting angry and saying and doing what you do now, will it be easier or harder to get what you want in the future? Now, usually the, the answers to those questions are obvious. The first question is the important one that needs to be asked. You just need to ask the questions. Usually everybody knows the answers to those. Now, step three is to develop, to develop what we call an internal locus of control. Like most people on the planet, if you're getting angry, you probably have an external locus of control. The vast majority of people walking the planet do. I started out with one. I, in some ways, I plug back into that sometimes. Okay, you wrongly see what others say and do as the cause of your anger. Now, how that hurts you, it needlessly puts you at the seeming mercy of what others say or do. Matt had a great quote from Epictetus that once you get angry, you're at the, somebody else becomes your master, okay? Now you give others power and control over how you feel that they really don't have. They don't have the power to make you angry unless you let them. Now you give away the real power and control you do have over how you feel, because it really comes from what you choose to think about things and you always have a choice how you wanna look at things. It implies others must start treating you better for you to be less angry. Well, my question is, what if they never do? What if they never stop treating you badly? Okay, it causes you to get angry needlessly and more so than is helpful. And more importantly, you miss many opportunities to not be angry. I used to always, when I presented to kids, I used to, or students, I used to always promise to teach them how to have real power. Real power is not getting angry, okay? That gives you a false sense of power. It's not telling others off or threatening people. It's not getting physical with others because that'll, that'll get you in jail, end up in jail that way. And it gives you other people, when you do things like that, it gives other people opportunities to do things to you, like police, that they otherwise might not have if you didn't get angry and act that way. Being real power is being able to choose whether you're going to get angry or not. It's being able to choose how you're going to feel at any given moment. And it's being able to get your life to play out the way you really want it to. That's real power. Okay. Now, developing an internal locus control is one of the most empowering things you can do for yourself. And it basically stems from a formula that I like to use about how life really unfolds. Event plus thoughts equals feelings, and your feelings drive your behavior. Now, and to put it into words, anything someone else says or does is just an event in your personal life. Your thought and life is really just one event after another coming at you. Some are real, some are remembered, some are imagined, some are internal, some are external. Okay. But it's really your thoughts about that cause your anger, not the events, not what others say or do. And your behavior will tend to follow your anger, meaning if you make yourself angry, you'll act like angry people typically do. Uh, your attitude is always the father of your behavior. So that's the importance of thoughts. And one of the things that uh, I learned a long time ago, they teach people in cardiac rehab programs, is no one upsets you, you upset yourself. Basically, the reason they do that is if somebody makes them mad, self-mad needlessly, it's their ticker, it's their heart that's going to struggle with that from the adrenaline rush. No one else is going to be inside their body. And if they end up going into cardiac arrest, that's no one else's problem but their own. So they teach people, no one upsets you, you upset yourself. Okay, people don't make you mad or piss you off is a common phrase now. 
You do that to yourself by the way you choose to think about or look at what others think, feel, say, and do. And there's always more than one way to think about or look at anything. Okay. Now, wrongly seeing others as the cause of your anger and blaming them for being angry causes you to wrongly see them as a threat. So this is one way that people manufacture threats where they don't or need not exist. That person becomes a threat to me because I believe in my own mind that he makes me mad or she makes me mad, but they don't do that. Now, another way people manufacture threats where they don't or need not exist has to do with what's called the symbolic self. The way I like to define it is, it's the person we want to be and be seen as by others. Now, being criticized, put down, or called names typically gets perceived as a threat to the symbolic self. Most people, that will happen. Now, a perceived threat to the symbolic self, the problem is it gets treated in the brain the same as a threat to life and limb, okay? So that's how people elevate this threat to something it's really not. Now, so what people say and do, the criticism, put down the name calling, it's really just an event in somebody's life. And how do you get the anger really is because of what they choose to think about what others say that really causes the threat and causes the anger. Now, you know, when you think about it, when I was a kid, I used to hear this all the time. You know, they teach you to say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Well, it turns out that's true, okay? Except nowadays we teach kids that words hurt. And I don't think we're doing them a favor by teaching them that. Yeah, if you get upset or hurt by what somebody says, that's part of being human. But I, I think when we teach kids words hurt, that encourages them to, they have that external locus of control, which puts them at the mercy of other kids. It also teaches other kids that they can have power over somebody who's not as you know strong enough to fight off what they're saying. Now, step four is to remind yourself of what you do and don't control. And the way I like to do it is I used to create what I call a circle of conflict. I used to draw this big circle on a chalkboard or later days, it was a dry erase board. And I would write that formula around two side, two halves of the circle. One half would be you, one half would be them. Whatever someone else says for you or says or does to you is an event. And you generate thoughts about that. Usually automatic thoughts that you've had many times before and you might get angry and then say or do something back. And that becomes a new event for the other person who does the same thing. And pretty soon you can go around this circle pretty quick because you all, everybody has these ruts for automatic thoughts and to get angry. So it's real easy for people to get going really fast in this circle and it gets out of hand real fast. Now, the important thing is what we do and don't have control. Many people think, talk and act as if they control what others think, feel, say and do. You might be able to influence what others think, feel, say and do. And that's what teachers do. That's what politicians do. That's what we do with our children. But you can't and don't control what others think, feel, say, or do. If you believe you do, that's an illusion. Okay? They can think, feel, say, or do whatever they want to. And all you got to do is get one defiant kid in a classroom and you'll realize that's true. They don't have to do anything, least of all what you want. I used to tell my fellow colleagues that sometimes. Well, these kids have to do what I tell them. No, they don't. They don't have to do anything, least of all what you want. They can say or do whatever they want to. The only person you control is what you, you and what you think, feel, say, or do. Now, the more you try to control what others think, feel, say, or do, the more out of control your life will feel, the more you'll find to get angry about, okay? I'm trying to control every little thing a kid does in my class. I'm gonna find a lot to get upset with. The more you focus on and work with what you do control, which is what you think, feel, say, and do, the more in control of your life you'll feel and the less you'll find to get angry about. Now, step five is learn what your, what we call hot thoughts are. Uh, there's a program called uh, rough spot training you do with little kids and they teach kids to make, recognize the difference between hot thoughts and cool thoughts. And then the idea is to try to substitute cool thoughts for hot thoughts. Now, uh, irrational, just to define that word, Simple way I define it is what you think makes you feel worse or angrier than is necessary or helpful. And what you think and feel causes you to say and do things that make your life worse and sometimes the lives of others worse instead of better. 
Now, Dr. Elvers Ellis identified four basic types of irrational thinking, which I really like this model because it's so simple to teach and for people to understand and recognize in themselves and others. There was demandingness, awfulizing, can't stand the itis, and label and damage. Now, demandingness, there's three basic ways you can look at anything. You cannot care about something and you can really not care about it or just sort of not care about it. You could want, prefer, desire something and just sort of want it, prefer, desire it, or really want, prefer, and desire it. Or you can think you need it, it's a necessity and demand it and just sort of think so or really think so. Now, the reason that's important is because the greater the difference between your expectations and reality, the greater the perceived threat will be and the more emotion you'll generate when you don't get what you want, prefer, or desire, lose it, or simply imagine doing either. Now, so here's how it might, I would graph it on a think, feel, do thermostat. So if you don't care, there's very little or any threat, so it's easy to remain calm. But once you want, prefer, and desire something, there's always a possibility you may not get it or lose it, or simply you might imagine doing either. So there is some threat. So you might have concern or frustration, irritation, or annoyance. But once you elevate that to need, necessity, and demand, the threat becomes much greater. And you're more likely to generate anxiety instead of concern, anger instead of frustration, irritation, and annoyance. Now, this is a major way people manufacture threats where they don't or need not exist or magnify ones that might out of, all out of proportion to reality. People can even equate what they want, prefer, and desire to air, water, and food in their own mind. That would make not getting what you want or losing it or simply imagining doing either like feel like suffocating or be perceived as suffocating almost the equivalent of dying of thirst or hunger. And it maximizes the perceived threat needlessly. Now you can make demands of your others, yourself and life. Anger can come from making demands of all three, but typically comes from making demands of others. Now, when constructing thoughts or comments, people will probably use the verbs like need to, like you need to do what I tell you to, have to, should, can't, or shouldn't. And here's some examples. Uh, for example, a teacher might say something like this. They need to show me some respect. They have to do what I tell them to. They should mind their own business. They can't do that to me. They shouldn't have said that about me. So those are some of the common, you know, hot thoughts people might have. Now, we also jokingly talk about shooting on others, yourself, and life. And it means you just use the verb should. Now, should could mean, I think it'd be a good idea. But very often when people use it, like you should mind your own business, they mean you have to or must. Okay. Now, Dr. Ellis used to jokingly call that masturbation, okay, which was one of his jokes about irrational thinking. Now, demands can also come in the form of a question. For example, how dare you or how dare they say that about me or talk to me like that? Or how could they act like that? How could somebody be so rude? Okay. Those are, that's like usually when people get into a real angry state, that's usually what they're thinking. And if you think about in the United States, we've had a lot of police killings where people kill innocent people. And sometimes it's a white officer killing a black uh, suspect. So, you know, when that happens, that's usually what's happening. How dare you not do what I tell you to? And that's how police work themselves into a rage and end up killing people, innocent, innocent people. Now, the second type of thinking is called awfulizing. And there's a lot of things in life that are unpleasant, inconvenient, or uncomfortable to some degree. And if that's the way you look at things, you generate some concern. For example, anxiety is caused from imagining something bad happening and then telling yourself it'll be awful. Well, if you just thought, well, it won't be that big a deal, then you probably have concern or be frustrated, irritated, or annoyed. But once you tell yourself it's awful, like the worst possible thing that could be happening to you at this moment, then you're going to generate either anxiety or anger. Now, the third type of thinking is called can't stand it itis. Now, I start with the idea that you have a right to like or dislike whatever you want to. Now, the problem is if you just didn't like something or wouldn't like it if it happened, you generate concern or frustration, irritation, or annoyance. 
But when you tell yourself you can't stand some or couldn't stand it if it did happen, then you're going to generate anxiety and anger. Now, these both both these types of thinking, awfulizing, couldn't uh, can't stand the itis, stem from setting your thermostat initially to need, necessity, and demand instead of want, preference, and desire. Now, you have, remember I said you have a right to like or dislike whatever you want to, including what someone else says or does. Now, the mistake you might make is to do what Dr. Ellis calls labeling and damning the person, okay? Sometimes label and damning comes after someone is angry. They'll get angry and say, you're an idiot, you're stupid, you're a moron. Or sometimes it's part of what triggers their anger that they do that kind of thinking in their own head. So this is, it's kind of the chicken or the egg kind of thing. And this is the way I would diagram it. But the bottom line is when you label and damn the person, you're condemning the doer instead of the deed and you make yourself more likely to get angry. Now, for example, you might sound like this. They're an idiot for doing that. They're stupid for talking to me like that. They're a jerk for treating me that way. Now, label and damning is basically overgeneralizing about a person, okay? It's like calling an apple bad just because it has a bruise, even though the rest of the apple is perfectly fine. That's my best way of explaining it. Now, it's condemning the doer instead of his deed, okay? Now, so step six is to challenge, learn how to challenge and correct your hot thoughts. For example, if you have the thought how or question, how dare they talk to me like that? Or how could they treat me like that? The answer, unfortunately, is easily. It doesn't take a lot of energy or effort for people to mistreat others, okay? Especially if they feel like somehow you've wronged them in some way, rightly or wrongly. Now, I used to always tell people, never ask a question for which you won't like the answer. That's something they teach lawyers in a courtroom. Don't ever ask a question for which you don't already know the answer and for which you won't like the answer. And people do that all the time when they say, how dare you talk to me like that? Well, unfortunately, the answer is easily. Now, if you had thoughts like this, they need to show me some respect, which is basically saying, I need them to do that. I would ask questions like this. Why do they need to? They need to, or you just want them to? Okay, you have a right to want them to, but why do they need to? They need, you need air, water, and food. You'll die in minutes, days, or weeks without, you, without them. Do you need their respect like you need air, water, and food? Okay, or could it just be nice to have? You need it or would you just like it? And it's okay for you to want it and like it. But when you start saying you need it, you've gone too far. You've elevated your think thermostat too high. Now, as far as can't, and you say, well, they can't or they shouldn't talk to me like that. I would just simply say, look, I don't like when people talk to me like that either. But why can't they? They can't or you just don't want them to. And the only right answers are they can. People can do whatever they want. They can, I just want, don't want them to. Or they can, I just would don't, would, don't like when they do. Now, as far as have to, okay. Uh, and what you wanna do is when I did this with my students, I tried to train them to automatically respond or react to words like have to or can't or shouldn't. And the interesting thing was that they actually got pretty good at it. And when a kid in a classroom would say, well, you have, and somebody else would say, why do they have to? They would automatically start shouting out questions like that, which is good. I did what I wanted to do. I accomplished what I wanted to. So if they say they have to or should do what I tell them to, well, yeah, it'd be nice if every kid did what you asked them to. Well, why do they have to? They have to, or you just want them to? And the only right answers are they don't have to. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to, you just want them to, which is fine. That's your right as a human being to want that. Teacher has a right to expect kids to cooperate. That doesn't mean they're going to do it. Now, as far as awfulizing, if you say, well, it's really awful they did that, why is it so awful? Is it awful or just unpleasant or maybe just inconvenient or uncomfortable? And the only correct answer is it's not awful, it's just unpleasant. Now, my brother-in-law is dying of cancer right at this moment. He's getting very weak. We don't expect him to live much longer. I, I'm not going to question whether that's awful. I mean, it is. That's one of the worst things that can happen to a human being. But so many other things people awfulize about fall far, far, far short of that. Okay. Now, if you say I can't stand when they do that, 
why can't you stand it? Can't stand it means you'd probably die or go crazy. Why well, are you going to die or go crazy? You can't stand it or just don't like it. And you want to keep these questions very simple and to the point and use as much word economy as possible. The shorter they are, the more likely are people to, for, for people to remember them and have them be an automatic part of their repertoire. Now, the only correct answer is I can stand it. I just don't like it. Okay, I'm not going to die or go crazy. And that's your right to not like something. Now, with practice, I, I jumped too far. Oh, I've jumped too far. Sorry. All right. Now, as far as the label and damning, if you said they're an idiot for doing that, I would say, look, I don't like what they did either. But why are they an idiot just because of that? They're an idiot or just did an idiotic thing. They're an idiot or just did something you didn't like. And the only correct answer is hopefully they realize are they're not an idiot just because of that, because smart people can do really stupid things. Nice people can do nasty things. They're not an idiot, just they just did an idiotic thing. They're not an idiot, they just did something I didn't like. And that's your right to not like it. Now, with practice and rehearsal, posing these questions becomes automatic. And they can act like grammar check. The best way I can describe it is kind of like grammar check or spell check on a computer. When I type something to do these presentations, I'll get, it'll underline it or highlight it in some way telling me, no, nah, that's not right. That's not right. So it immediately corrects it and challenges it. Okay. And then I get a chance to make corrections. Well, that's what happens if you practice these questions. It becomes so automatic that you, you short circuit the things, the hot thoughts that cause you to get angry. Now, step seven is something we call put your verbal behavior where you want your attitude to be, which means practice talking the way you want to think. Now, we have to talk about I messages versus you messages. Now, in the, May, the list I gave you earlier for Mayo Clinic, one of, the, one of the things on their list was use I statements. Okay, and that's basically what we call I messages. Now, you messages are things like orders, for example, shut up or you don't really say the you, but it's implied. Threats, you had better do that or else. Put down, you're so stupid. All right, name calling, you're an idiot. And usually you point your finger at the other person, which very often gets perceived as threatening. And that's why people don't respond very well to you messages. Now, they're also called solution messages because they often try to take away from someone their right to choose what they'll think, feel, say, or do. And that gets perceived as threatening because no one likes that. No one likes to have their freedom to choose taken away from them. Now, I messages simply start with I. They simply give you know, others information, like, for example, what you like or don't like, what you want or don't want. And sometimes you can tell people how you feel, but you got to be careful not to make them responsible for it by saying something like, well, you make me really angry. No, I, I get really upset. When that happens, that's fine. That's okay to share, but sometimes that'll backfire too. Use verbs like want, like, prefer, rather, wish, and appreciate. And you leave it up to them what they want to do about that information you give them. If you point your finger at anybody, you point it at yourself. Say, I don't like when you talk to me like that. I don't want you to treat me that way. Those are I'm at. Now, what you're doing here is Normally, when people set their thermostat at need, necessity, demand, they're more likely to generate anger and use verbs like need to, have to, can, shouldn't, and shouldn't, which are you messages. So what you want to try to do is turn your, go down and practice talking, make it a point to try to make it, force yourself to start with I and learn to use I messages. And what happens ultimately is it works backwards, to turning your think thermostat down which means you'll permanently reduce the frequency, intensity, and duration of anger. And you, you, you still get frustrated, irritated, annoyed. You might even jump back up to anger once in a while. But if you, the more you practice I messages, the more likely you are to stay, keep your thermostat turned down. Now, step eight is what I call having a step-by-step -step process to learn from your mistakes and to generate a more functional amount of emotion in the future. Now, Dr. Ellis had an ABC theory of emotions, and this is how it matches up with the, the formula I use. He had an activating event plus your beliefs about the event, yourself, others, life, results equals your consequences or what you feel and do as a consequence of what you believe 
about the event, the self, others, and life. Well, that's pretty much the same formula as I use, just a different version of it. I actually got mine from a program called uh, Active Parenting. It's called Active Parenting. Now, so these are the steps. Step one or two could be, what is the activating event? Step one or two could be consequences. How did you make yourself feel? What did you do? And then you identify the beliefs and then you do what's called disputing, which is questioning and challenging your thoughts, your hot thoughts. And then you come up with effective coping statements of things you could say instead to yourself or think instead that would cause you to be less angry. Now, the activating event basically you say, what happened? Okay. Now, people like to go on and on about what others said and did because they wrongly see what happened and what others say and do as the cause of their anger. So they think somehow letting you know why they're angry is part. Well, that's not the important part. The important part is what they thought or what you thought about what they did. Now, the consequence, you just basically say, how did you make yourself feel? Notice how I said that. How did you make yourself feel? What, if anything, did you say or do? And did that make things better or worse? And then you identify the beliefs. You know, what were you thinking? What were you telling yourself? What was going through your head? Now, I like to use this chart for brainstorming demands of others. I basically, I used to write this on my chalkboard and I just list all the verbs and then I would list the pronouns and just connect the two. And you end up brainstorming thoughts like this. How dare they talk to me like that? How could they be so, how could he be so disrespectful? She needs to show me more respect. You can't talk to me like that. They shouldn't be so disrespectful. She has to talk nicer to me than that. He should be more respectful. So it's easy to brainstorm these thoughts. Now to brainstorm the other beliefs, you simply add the event, either real or imagined to the statements. Like it's really awful that they talk to me that way. I can't stand when people talk to me like that. They're stupid for talking, saying or doing that to me. Now, so these are some examples. It's really awful that he's so disrespectful. I can't stand when he talks to me like that. You're an idiot for talking to me like that. Now, then you would dispute, okay? Question and challenge those the way I suggested earlier. And then you come up with some effective coping statements. For example, the only person I really control is me. They can do whatever they want to. They don't have to do anything. People have done worse. It's over and done with. That's what I use with my wife all the time. She really, well, she, I do this often. She really ruminates and goes over and over about stuff long after it happens. It's over and done with. It's water under, I used to say, when I was a kid, you say it's water under the bridge. Okay. I can stand it. I just don't like it. I've survived worse. Now, the whole point of this, though, is you've got to practice, practice, and practice. Everybody has deep ruts for hot thoughts and for getting angry and for what you say and do when you're angry. Everybody has those. Your hot thoughts, anger, and your behaviors are very automatic. And once you create those ruts, you can't get rid of them. You can only make new ones by practicing and rehearsing new ways of thinking, feeling, and saying and doing things. Okay. You can always slip into your old ruts at any point and probably will. I still get angry when I'm in traffic sometimes. When I hear things politicians say on the radio, sometimes I get angry about that. Okay. Even if you create new ruts, you can still plug in. The, it's kind of like somebody going through a city and they've got a new road they built, but sometimes you turn the wrong way and end up on your old road and stuck in traffic again. Okay. Your best hope is deepening those ruts for your new ways of thinking, feeling, saying, and doing things through practice and rehearsal. That's your best hope. And even if you do plug into your old ruts, it'll be much easier to get out of those old ruts if you have some new ruts you can plug into instead. And that's basically the way it works. That's the simplest way I can explain it. And I think I'm done. Yep. Okay, stop sharing. There we go. I'm done. <clears throat> Great stuff. I was taking notes like crazy again. Um, I like the way you you say, think this, not this. It makes it really, really clear. If you think this, you're going to get angry. If you think this, you probably be less angry. Real simple. It's a real popular way of describing it now. Eat. Don't eat this. Eat this, right? Don't do this. Do this. Think this. Don't think this. That's great. Very clear. Well, 
there's some things that we're hardwired for. And you have to understand what your hardwiring is. We're hardwired to get angry. We're hardwired to perceive threats. Unfortunately, sometimes that it's a double-edged sword. It's saved a lot of lives, but it's also sometimes had some untoward effects. Some turned out some in ways that we don't really like, and it's not very helpful. So the trick is to try to understand that process, identify it, become more aware of it, and then work with it to try to turn things around in a different direction, a better direction. So. Yes, yes. Okay, Excellent. thank you. Thank you very much. This is a wonderful talk on prevention as well as management of anger. Anger is inevitable. Right? It naturally comes, but uh, it was became a habit making so much negative with this type of anger. So, uh, Gladson Mathis, please. You have any questions or anything? Person, sir, can you see? Okay, okay, okay. okay. I, I hope you, you can hear me. Thank yes, yes. Sure. Uh, my question is to Matt, please. The, you said yes, about the, the triggering thing, uh, not triggering the star, uh, the, uh, the origin of that anger is from thought. Okay. 100% origin of that anger is from thought. My uh, question is this. Sometimes we, in, like a reflex action in a flash of second, we get triggered and we get into uh, bust out, blast out and a sort of uh, impulsive anger comes. So how do you connect it with the thought, please? Oh, well, uh, it's a good question. Yeah, go ahead, Ray. <laughs> well, it's a good question. I'd like about, to say something about it when you're done. Think about a calculator. You know, we take a calculator and we type two plus two and equals and four pops on the screen instantly. Well, it's almost like magic. But what there's processing <laughs> that's going on in between there. And there's you know all kinds of wiring inside there and circuits that allow that to happen. Well, that's what's happening with your brain. You have some, when you practice things, especially in situations where you find threatening, your brain's gonna kind of try to make those automatic because that's life, could be life-saving. So you develop these automatic responses and it can happen so fast and process so fast okay. and it needs to that your brain, it's easy for you to conclude on the outside or your awareness to conclude that there's nothing in between this and that because it happens so fast. They come together so quickly, there can't possibly be something in between. Well, what you need to do is slow it down and then you find that there is something in between. For example, when I work with people who are angry, I'll say, have you ever heard yourself say this? Do you ever think this? And they'll say, oh yeah, that's what I think all the time. <laughs> If you slow it down, for it's kind of like a message board going across the screen and the speed is cranked up really fast and you can't see what's there. It's just going so fast. The trick is to slow it down and you'll realize that there are things in between the event and your anger. It just happens so fast and your brain process, it's, that's life-saving to process that. That's why the brain does it. The more faster it processes, the more likely you are to be saved from a real threat. There's an old saying, he who hesitates is lost. Well, if you hesitate, it might cost you your life. Of course, many times people react too fast and then they have costing their life or somebody else's too. So there is something in between, but it's just because it happens so quickly from practice and rehearsal, it's so automatic that people assume there's nothing in between. Well, that's why we try to slow it down, sometimes even on paper, and let you see, yeah, there is a step in between here. Right, and right, it, that so it's happening, Gladson. There, it, it is. There is a thought happening in between there. What uh, another way that we break it down even further is that um, there are we have what we call belief systems, and Ray mentioned those belief systems are big generalized thoughts like um, like this isn't fair or um, life isn't fair or I don't fit in or I'm powerless or um, you know stuff like that big 
thinking stuff that is belief systems lots of times that these come from our past way in our past and they're big generalized beliefs about how life is and they become our um our kind of ruling uh, rules for ourselves and they're often unconscious like ray was just saying there if you slowed it way down you would hear them um but you have to slow it way down to get to those because they're big and they're general they're more general and specifically what's happening in the situation then you have to react to those thoughts as well so our belief systems our thoughts or they were originally thoughts they also became feelings also they also got locked in our body and they become automatic and response or uh reactions versus responsion responsions is that a word good uh so <laughs> we respond rather than we react if we can figure out what we thought before we react before then we can um and we can change it then we can do it better we can do it different but we we do look at our thoughts they have their belief systems or our low deep generalized values about life and then our current thoughts about what's going on in this current situation both levels of thoughts precede our feeling even though it happens really really quickly a lot of times does that make yeah, sense I, do you agree what do you think go ahead Ray. yeah yeah, that's well, the, fine. the other example I use sometimes is imagine if we thought out some caveman and brought him out and put him in the middle of the street and a bus came barreling toward him. Would he get out of the way? He has to recognize that as a threat. He might just sit there and stare at it until it crushed him. You know, it, it's you got to have that perception. You can call it whatever you want to call it perception, call it meaning, call it thought. But you have to have that there in order to perceive a threat. Now, I think of rattlesnakes when I walk through the desert. First time you hear a rattle like that, you, you, well, you've seen it many times on TV in old Western movies. So, you know, you recognize that sound, you might. But if I never had heard that sound before, would I react to it as a threat? I don't know. I'd be curious what the sound was because it's something different than what I've been experiencing before that. Uh, the other thing is, you know, babies have a startle response. If I shake a rattle in front of my little uh, four-month-old grandson, he's startled. He go, jumps like that. So that has that. So maybe that's part of it. That's built in. That's hardwire. But all this other stuff that people usually, that cause them to get angry, the thoughts and perceptions or beliefs, whatever you want to call them, those are all learned from and usually automatic from years and years of practice. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. So my my um, my that's fine. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Philomena, ma'am, can you have some questions? Philomena, ma'am, can you hear? Before we get off that other subject, there is some argument about some science Science folks would say that you do not always think before you feel. In fact, some say that you feel first and then you think. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, it seems to me if that is true, sometimes if it's true, I think it's sometimes I think we usually have a thought before we have a feeling. And as Ray was talking about what we can control and what we can't, um, if we if our feelings comes first and then our thought, then it's harder to control the th feeling. But if you can deal with the feeling before the thought, then there's more things you can do with it. You have more power, you have more power and you have more control and you can do something about it. So anyway, okay, I, I think it that. usually, usually thought comes first. What, Dre? I've always thought that was just really a, a semantic thing where somebody, whether you're calling it a perception well, versus a thought or, you know, you perceive something. Well, yeah, that well, could be very automatic, but that's still, I would call that a thought. <laughs> so true. But true. It, but there, no I've been, I've had arguments with folks before, science folks who say that feelings come first. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm not so a science guy. The paternity is coming. Uh, thought, feeling, thought, feeling like that. Such a uh, the proceedings will be there always. That depends upon the feeling also. Pilamarama, can you say something? Yeah, I like the way he said about I message and you message. So most of yeah. the time we are all we are failing to do the I message instead of the you message. And also when he said about his wife talking about you know once it's under the bridge. So I have to say myself also on that behalf, 
when I get angry with my husband, I have to talk like hours just about it, about it, about it. And my husband, what he does is he just gets out of that room. Sometimes he takes the car and take off. And my kids ask, who are you talking to? Because daddy is not even here. Until it gets rid of my system, I have to continue to talk about it until, you know, my anger gets released. So I do that too. So is there any way, any solution for that? <laughs> oh, is there any solution for any ruminating? Good. You mean going over and over yeah. again? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. to, well, I would say identify what your thoughts are and and challenge and correct them. So that it kind of, you know, instead of you going down that pathway and keep going there, take that thought, challenge it and correct it. But first you got to, I sometimes would encourage people to write things down on paper and put your thoughts on paper and then practice rehearsing and responding to those in a different way. Because you got to remember, you always have a choice what you want to think at any given moment. That's a choice. It comes automatically. So it doesn't feel like you have a choice. But you can learn to have a choice and regain that power to choose by identifying the thoughts and challenging and correcting them and have that become so automatic that it acts like, like I said, grammar check on a computer. Okay. But and the other thing is to ask yourself, how's that working for you to do that? How's it work for you to just ruminate and go over and over and over again? My wife gets herself all worked up and then she says and does a lot of things that make everything worse. And then there's bigger fights. So how's that working? It's not working, you know, so. Yeah, that so is true. Uh, that in, that, 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 in that situation, yeah. <laughs> instead of having the fight, my husband just get out. So he doesn't have to listen to it and fight about it. So, um, mm. so, but I will be, until my anger over, I continue saying over and over the thing. So I'm glad you told me that to write it. You know, right. Well, your challenge, see your challenge, your challenge would be to, for your own good and the sake of your relationship, your marriage, is to learn to bring your thermostat down. That's not something he can do. That's something a personal journey you have to make. Everybody has to do that on their own, and you know, and for the sake of yourself, because there's an old Chinese proverb: a man who angers himself should dig two graves one for himself and one for the enemy he seeks to destroy. Well, you know, nobody's, he's not inside your skin. You're the only one inside your skin. He's not having to deal with all that anger. You're the only one having to deal with it. And if you look at the at medical information, anger is related to a lot of illness. You just don't want to go there. It's just, you know, it's there to save your life. But if you're going there for no good reason, you're just predisposing yourself to all kinds of health problems. So, Philomena, if I could, if I, if I could add to that, um, Ray's really good at the thought process behind the feeling, which he's right. I mean, that, there's all kinds of thoughts that happen behind the feeling that you can adjust. We call it spin it to win it. If it's if what you're thinking is not working for you, then change it. Do a different. Make put and make a different thought so that you can change what you're feeling. However, I also will add to that, that's left brain. That's our thoughts behind the feeling. So it's our IQ of our EQ, I call it. But there's also the feeling itself. You're upset. You're already upset, right? You're mad about something and you're upset. And sometimes when in order to get rid of our upsetness, it doesn't matter what we think, it, we're upset about it. And sometimes we need to talk it out we need to feel it. We need to express it, right? Whether it's to him or not. Some We call it the difference between complaining and venting sometimes is that complaining is rah, 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 I'm, I'm angry, I'm angry, I'm angry. Venting is I'm angry and I don't want to be angry anymore. I'm saying this so that I get it out of my body, better out than in, not doesn't have to be on him or even at him. He doesn't even have to hear about it, or he could. If he could shut up and listen to you for a minute and you tell him what you're angry about in a way that you're releasing it, you're letting it go and releasing it from your body, and then you feel so much better afterward, right? So much better afterward. And it doesn't have to be him. It could be somebody else. But venting is a magical thing for healing. Can I, Thank I, you. I Thank you. With one last, can I leave you with one last thought? When you get anger, anybody gets angry, 
your your belief is basic, your thought is basically, or your demand is everything has to be the way I want it to be. Everyone has to be the way I want them to be. When you okay. say it like that, how old does that sound? So that's why Albert Ellis used to call anger a temper tantrum, because you're basically demanding that everybody and everything be the way you want it to be. And that's what causes you to get angry when it's not or depressed. For example, if you think this shouldn't be happening to me in my life, instead of I wish this wasn't happening, you're going to get depressed instead of simply be sad. So think about that. Just how old does that sound when you're saying everybody has to do what I want? Well, sounds like somebody two or three years old. And we can do that because we were two or three year olds once. And we went through that whole couple of years of our life, you know, processing things that way and being demanding and it's rutted in our brain. And those ruts are always going to be there. So we can always act like a two or three year old and demand everybody and everything be like the way we want them to be, except that's not going to work very well because nobody has to do anything. People can do whatever they want to think, feel, say, and do whatever they want to. And their job is not to do what we want. Their job is to take care of themselves, get what they want as, as, as much as possible in their life. It's not to take care of us. If they can take care of us at the same time, that's wonderful. If I can help my wife feel better and do things that she wants to be able to do, that's great. But I also have to, I'm the only one that can take care of me. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank It's really you. hard to me. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. So today, uh, RABT also explained along with uh, anger management, anger prevention is a wonderful tool for prevention of these things. Anybody have some uh, doubts? Anybody want to say something about uh, prevention and management of anger? Okay, thank you. Then thank you, Mr. Matt and Mr. Ray for wonderful speak on anchor, its prevention, as well as the management. Definitely prevention is always better than cure, uh, as it says in the courts. So okay. thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. So next week also we'll have some other topics with anxiety, isn't it? Anxiety. Anxiety. Anxiety, anxiety right. uh, prevention and management, same, same, same way. So thank you once again, uh, both of you. And thank you all others people also. Thank you. See you and good night. And Bye -bye. for you, it is good morning, isn't it? Have a wonderful day. Yes. Sun's coming up. <laughs> yes. Thanks, guys. Take yes, care. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.